Exodus this morning. If you remember, um, I really don't know how long ago it's been. I didn't, I didn't do the, the counting, but remember we were going through Exodus and we got to Moses' tabernacle and, uh, and I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't continue on. There was, uh, at that time, I, just, I needed to study a lot more. And I saw something in it that I'm like, this is good stuff. And I think will be one of the, it'll be a perfect Easter message. That's what I'm thinking in my mind. But as I started studying, it just got longer and longer and longer. So I think I can do it in two days. But uh, instead of making you stay for, you know, two hours or so, uh, we're going we're gonna to chop it up. And uh, it, that's not two hours, hour and a half probably. Um, but uh, we're going to be in Exodus, and uh, and I think uh, I think you'll see some. I hope that I hope that you enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed studying this. Um, just uh, some good stuff in understanding the tabernacle. Now, this is the original tabernacle that God gave to Moses, and uh, I want you to see something in Exodus, beginning in chapter twenty-five. Uh, I'll read a. I'll read a text of scripture there first. In verse 8, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, I don't, you know, the sanctuary, it, it, it's, it's the tabernacle of God. That's, that's really what we, what we mean here. And God wanted them to do this because he wanted to dwell with his people. And if you see it there, that's kind of what it looks like. It looks simple, right? Now, I want you to think about this. This is the, this is the way that God wanted to dwell among his people during the days of Israel. But he doesn't do that anymore. He wants to dwell inside of you. That your body is his tabernacle. That's what R Romans chapter 12 now says. That present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He wants to be, he wants to, he wants to be in your body, and he wants you to be that sacrifice system, whereas he can dwell with you. And that's that's what we see in this picture. So we're gonna we're gonna pause there and we're just gonna pray. Dear Lord, I just ask that you would just guide, uh, guide our hearts and our minds, especially me, Lord. You know, uh, you 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 know what you've taught me through this and i just pray that you would just help me to communicate that that learning to to your people i pray lord for the the power of your holy spirit to be able to present your word properly and accurately and just guide us lord through these things and teach us more about you in these in these things in jesus name i pray amen so understanding the tabernacle we see that there's God's desire is to dwell with his people. That's never changed. His desire is still to dwell with his people. Well, that happens to be you. But no longer does he want a tabernacle out there that you go to to, to get in the presence of God. But now your body is it. He wants to be with you all the time. Whereas, you know, you are sealed with that, with his Holy Spirit inside of you. Look in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 9, just a little bit, just the next verse. It says, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So we see that there is a pattern. There is a pattern that is that God shows us here in, in Exodus 25, a pattern of displaying the tabernacle, that it means something more than just what meets the eye. It's so much more. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, Ye also as lively stones. You see, Peter, he reaches back and he says, it's not just about a physical building. It's about you. It's about what I want for your life. Looks like I'm having a little bit of trouble there, huh? Let me, let me fix that real quick. The devil must think this is a good one because he's trying to mess it up, isn't he? Let's 
So 1 Peter 2, 5, it says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. You know, one of the things that we miss out sometimes is that whenever you're saved, whenever you're born again, there is such a thing that they call the priesthood of the believer. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? The priesthood of the believer? Basically what that means is, just like Aaron was in the Old Testament, and, and his sons, had they had to consecrate themselves, yet they were able to go into the Holy of Holies to be in God's presence. Now that is given to you because Jesus Christ died for your sins. He's cleansed you. He has made unto you. Unto, he's made us his priest. Kings and priests, the scripture will tell us, he has made us. That he has built you as a holy priesthood so that you no longer need anybody to go to talk to God for you. You can go talk to God. You don't need somebody in between. You can go straight to him yourself. I don't, you don't need to come to me. You don't need to go to a, a, a different person. All you need to do is present yourself before the Almighty. That's the way it works now. You don't need somebody in between. You can go yourself. You are built up as a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the big picture here. All of this has been made possible because of what Jesus did. It wasn't because of what Israel did. Israel kept messing up. It's not because of what you've done. You keep messing up. You needed somebody perfect. That somebody is Jesus Christ. And that is what we're seeing. The first thing that we see about, about this, and, and, and please pardon how I put it together. I put it together. The way that you go in, it's not put together like that in the scripture. So it jumps around. But the first thing that you see as you approach the tabernacle of God, is the gate. You know what's significant here? You see in the picture, there's only one gate. There's one door. There's only one way. The presence of God is on the inside. And there's only one way to get to the presence of God. You've got to go through the gate. Exodus chapter 27 and verse 16 illustrates that. You can go read that for yourself. It just tells you that there's a gate and how to make it and what it puts together. It's, the, it's a curtain. The entrance door it faces east and there's only one way in. One way. And if you come to the gate without an offering, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be turned away. If you're going to go inside the tabernacle area... And you're going to go through the gates. You must bring an offering. Leviticus chapter 5, uh, chapter 5 through 7 tells what kind of offerings are acceptable. We're not going to go through all that. That's a whole other teaching ser uh, series that would probably take another two hours in a, of itself. But you've got to know, you don't come through the gate unless you bring something with you. You must bring an offering. Now, John... Chapter 10 and verse 9, Jesus tells his people, his disciples, he says, I am the door. Y'all look, it's flip in your Bible with me and let's look at that verse together. You need, you need to see this. People think, people think that they can get to God through any way. They think there's, there's many ways to God's presence. Jesus says there's only one way and it's through the door. And he says, I am the door. Chapter, John chapter 10 and verse 9. It says this, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You know how you, how you get saved? You go through the door. Salvation is on the inside. Everyone on the outside, they're not saved. They must come through the door. They must go through the gate. And there's one way. And shall go in and out and find pasture. If you're going to be saved... You must go through the door. You must go through the gate. And there's only one. Jesus. Jesus is the only way. Man, are you getting excited about the, learning about the tabernacle yet? Even from the... They could, have, they could have put all kinds of gates there. You could have come in from the south. Nope. One way. One way. 
And that one way for us now is Jesus. And you know, you don't come to Jesus without an offering. You've got to bring something with you. You know, so many people think, well, I can just say the prayer. Well, something must come with that prayer. Something must come with the person. John the Baptist, he would say it like this in Matthew 3 and verse 8. Bring forth fruit and meat for repentance. Now, we know this. Jesus said, I'm also the offering. You want to go through the gate? That's me. You got to bring me with you. You got to bring an acceptable sacrifice. And it's not any work that you can do. It's the work that he does. It is only by Jesus. He is the only offering. And that's the offering that we need to teach and we need to preach. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 18 says the preaching of the cross is the power of God. You know, we're going into we, You know, we just left Christmas and we talked about the baby Jesus and we get to the resurrection day. And a lot of people, they get they get excited about the resurrection of Jesus. And I get excited about the resurrection of Jesus. But there, if there never was a cross of Jesus, there would never be salvation for you. The preaching of the cross is the power of God. Does it sound foolish? Man, it sounds foolish. How can, you know, when you talk to this lost world, they're like, somebody had to die for me to be saved? Yes, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And you've got a sin problem that you've got to deal with. Well, Jesus is the one who's dealt with that sin problem. The preaching of the cross is the power of God. If you're going to be saved, it's because you believe in what happened on the cross. Now, here's a picture of this, what this tabernacle area looks like. As soon as you get inside the gate, if you see the three colored lines there, that's the gate. And then we come to, then we see that there is, uh, that's, how, that's just how the tabernacle area is lined up. The, whole, the, the Holy of Holies has the, you know, it, it's another building inside of that. So we're going we're gonna to get to all that. We're not going to talk about that part today. That's the good stuff. We're saving that for next week. In Exodus chapter 27, 9, 9 through 19, it talks about this court. It holds every part that, requ that is required for God's plan of salvation. Once you go through the gate, once you go through the door of Jesus, you see that there is a plan of salvation laid out before us. If you ever wondered what the plan of salvation was, we're going to learn about it through the tabernacle experience. And there's the altar, there's the brass lever, there's the holy of holies. All of that is part of the one plan of salvation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 talks about it like this. From faith to faith. It's like you, as you, as you get experience of Jesus, you get to that next level from faith to faith. Until you reach to the day of salvation that, you know, there is a growing process. That's why when we witness to people or what they tell us when we witness to folks, that sometimes that we have to witness to people seven, eight, not many times before they ever accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And what is it doing? It's growing them. It's growing their faith. You ever wonder how to get faith in people? The scripture tells us it's the word of God. Romans tells us that if you lack faith, you need more word. That the reading of the word produces faith. Romans tells us that. But we see here that there's the tools for the sacrifice. That's really the first thing. You, you, they would bring in They would bring in the sheep. They would bring in the, the goat or the lamb or whatever it is that's going to be sacrificed. And then there's all these tools that are, that are there. And those tools mean something. And you start thinking about what all these tools and these dishes. Well, how does that apply to like... Me to my sal to that salvation plan. Well, it applies like this, like Romans eight twenty eight. All things work together for the good of them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. You see, you're not saved from birth. God does some things in your life. He does some works. He uses all kinds of different tools to get you to that salvation place. Sometimes it's good stuff. Sometimes it's bad stuff. 
But all of those things, the good and the bad, all those things work together for your good. Those who love God. He's working those things. You know, sometimes we were like, you know, I, don't, I just don't see how God can use this. Well, you probably can't see it until, you, until, until you've gone past it. It's when you look back. It's, it's kind of like, it's kinda like a, a tornado. You know, most people don't see a tornado coming, but you can always tell where it's been. Right? That's how God is in, your, in a lot of our lives. That we can't see where he's going with this. But when we look back, we can tell exactly where he, where he was. Where, he, where he's been in my life. And he uses those things to draw people closer to him. He uses those to draw me closer to him. All these things are tools that he uses for your good. I, you want to know what's good? You being saved by grace through faith. That's good. That's good. That's what he's talking about. God works that good in their life. To them that are called according to his purpose. Hey, God's will is that all should be saved. That's his purpose. And he works those things. And they bring that altar or they bring that, that sacrifice to the altar. <coughs> And the altar is where the blood is applied. Exodus, Exodus chapter 27, verses 1 and 2. Let's read those two verses together. They're pretty short. And it says, Thou shalt make an altar of, of, of sittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall have be four square and the height thereof three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with brass. So we get here, and this is where the sacrifice is done. This is where conversion happens in a person's life. They, the person comes in. They want to get to God's presence. That's it. That's, a, that's at the end of this. They come in through the door of Jesus. That's the only way they can come in. And God uses those tools to get them to this point where the blood is applied to their life. Amen? The sacrifice is made. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? Hey, it was very important for them to bring in the right animal. It was very important for them to bring in the right things without spot, without blemish. It was very important. How much better is the blood of God manifest in the flesh? Who gave himself as a ransom for many. You know why they would bring the lamb or the bull to the altar? So that you wouldn't have to die on that altar. It was the atonement for your sin. And Jesus became the atonement for your sin because he's better than any lamb or any bull could ever think to be. How much more the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works and serve the living God. <clears throat> First Peter 1 and 19. The precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, we have a lot of people today that do not regard the blood of Christ precious in their life. You know, we grow, we have, we have a bunch of animals at my house, mainly chickens and, and some quail, but we've got a cat and we've got two cats and a dog. And Joy is constantly wanting me to, to get other things. Can you imagine that? And you know what keeps her from getting those other things? I tell her, are you going to eat them? Is that mean? Some people are like, oh, that's mean. And she's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. 
If the blood of an animal is so precious to people, so much so that they, that they couldn't even kill them for their own food, for their own survival, how come we trample all over the blood of Christ? Isn't his blood more precious than any animal? Isn't his blood more precious than any of those things? Yet people in our world, they value the value of animals much more than they value the blood of Christ. What's wrong with us? I'll tell you what's wrong with us is that we worship the creation more than the creator. The blood, pre precious is his blood. You know, his blood is different than any lamb. It's everlasting. And his blood is what washes your sins away. He paid the price for your sin. And he came without spot, without, spot, without blemish. That is the point that conversion happens in a person's life. When you accept the blood of Jesus applied to your life. Yeah, you can know where the, where the door is. You could even bring something in. But if you don't accept the blood on the sacrifice, you're not going to make it any further. Something has to die on the altar. Something must go. Something must pay the price for sin. And Jesus paid the price for our sins. And it just happens to be that the next thing is the brass lever. Now, this brass lever, it's a it's a it's a big it's it's a big bowl full of water. It's an area for the priest to wash themselves clean after the sacrifice has covered them. Isn't that good stuff? When the blood's applied, you're washed of all your sins. We simulate that by being baptized. Do you know that? After, the, after I've accepted the blood of Christ in my life, Jesus said, be baptized. That's what John the, the baptizer would say. Come and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Not because that's not what gives you forgiveness of your sins. That's not remisses you of your sins. But because there is the sins remiss, then you're cleansed. Then you're washed and you're washed clean. You go through the other side and then. Then you can approach the holies of holies. Look at what Isaiah 116 says. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. You know, when you've really accepted the blood of Jesus Christ in your life and you've allowed him to purge your iniquities from you, you want to be washed clean of all those things. You don't want evil in your life anymore. You know what, you know what evil is? Evil is just sin. You know what sin is? Sin is doing anything that displeases God. We have a clue. Those, those lie in the commandments. But it's, it could be more. Those just are the start. But you want to do what God wants you to do. And you want to put away the evil. You don't want to rebel against God anymore. You want to do exactly what he wants you to do. And you don't want to do it in front of his eyes. You want to put. And God says put away those things from your eyes. You know if we could ever have James. Come and preach, he would probably hurt our feelings so bad, you know that? Because he would do like this. He would point his fingers at everybody out there and he would say, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. You're holding on to things that you need to let go. You need you're holding on to things that the blood of Christ can cleanse you from. Let him cover these things. Wash your hands of the evil. Quit doing those things in the eyes of the, the Almighty and purify your hearts. Quit being double-minded. Don't think that you can have the things of this world and the things of God. No man can serve two masters or either he will love the one and hate the other. He's going to cling to the one and despise the other. You can't have the best of both worlds. 
You, when you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're no longer of this world. You're of the next world. You become a pilgrim. You're just passing through for a little while. Your home is no longer here. Your home is somewhere else. It's in heaven. And you're just waiting to get there. And the things of this world just bother you. And you feel like you don't fit in anymore. And there's a reason. God's given you a new mind. A new heart. And here's, here's what happens when you get a new mind and you get a new heart. Hey, a new life comes out of that transformed state. Be you transformed, as the scripture says, by the renewing of your mind. And after you get to that point, you're cleansed, the blood's applied, and we see what that transformed state looks like as the coverings over the tabernacle. This is where this is this is called the holiest of holies or the holiest in Hebrews chapter nine and verse three. Look at this verse, Hebrews nine and eleven, but Christ being come to a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by the blood of Christ. You see, we're standing there. We've gone through all the steps. We're standing before the holiest of holies. Now before only the high priest could go any further. But because of Jesus, you can go forward now. You can be bold to go in. You know, when the high priest used to go in, they would tie a rope onto him. And people, and people on the outside would be holding on to the rope. And they'd be feeling. Because sometimes high priests would go in there and their hearts were not right with God. And they'd quit moving. And they would have to be drug out and then buried it's important to make sure everything is right in your life. Man, this is hard to do. Jesus changed some things. And when his blood is applied to your life, you can go into the holies of holies with boldness. Not because of anything that you've done but because of what he's done. And you don't have to worry about having a rope tied to you and thinking that I'm going to die if I go into the presence of God. No, you can go. You can go because of what Jesus did. And that's what it says. You can go in by the blood of Jesus. Now this holiest, it represents something on the coverings. That's kind of what it looks like. There's four different coverings that are on this. And you can read about it in Exodus chapter 26, 1 through 14. But the, but the covering that you see is badger skin. It's a very, it's a very uh, tough, uh, it's a very, very tough skin. A marine animal, very durable. Now I want you to hold on to something, okay? Because you know what I see? I see the outside. That's what I see when I look at you. I can only see the outside. I can't see what's on the inside. I can't see what's, what, what's covering, what, what, what your skin is covering. I can't see your heart. I can't see your mind. What's on the inside is important. Isaiah 118. I want you to hold on to this verse as we go through these. It says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they, be, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We're going to come back to some of that. The next skin. But hold on to that, hold on to that thought. The next skin is a ram skin. It's dyed red. Well, that represents the sacrifice for sin. That's what Jesus did. That's his blood applied. Isaiah 118. Though your sins be as scarlet, they could be red as and though they be red, though your sins be as scarlet, they could be made as, as wool. Though they be red as crimson. Oh, um, I think I got it wrong. I got I think I got it back. And though your sins be as scarlet, they could be made white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they could be made 
as wool. That's where our Isaiah 118 verse 6. And then the next one is goat hair. It's a black. It's black covered. It's covered by the red ram skin. The black, it represents our hearts. Our blacks are, our, our hearts are dirty. There's got to, we've got, we've got to, we've got to deal with that. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then that final one is linen. It's white. It's embroidered with blue and purple and scarlet designs of the, with cherubims on it. Now I want you to think about this verse, uh, 118 a little bit. That you could be made white as snow, made as wool. When you deal with your sins, you've gone through the gate of Jesus Christ. You've accepted the sacrifice on the altar. You've gone through the laver and you've and you've you've been made clean. You approach the Holy of the Holies and you see the coverings on the, on it, that those who go in must be covered with these things. And that white linen. It shows the personality of the person going in. Somebody who's as the angels in heaven without sin. Without spot in their life. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 30 says it like that. Now I want you to think about this just for a second. What others see is not what God has completed in someone who makes it to the holy of holies. That's what that badger skin is. You know, that's what, that's what this world sees. We can't see what God has done in your life. We can't see what this, what your skin is covering. We just can't. But look at what we see here. We see that black heart covered in red blood of Christ. And it makes you white as snow. Do you see that in the picture? We've got Isaiah telling us some stuff. But what we see is the process of one who enters into the Holy of Holies. And you're going to be covered with these coverings. As somebody with a black heart. Covered cover with Christ's red blood. But made white as snow. How do you get there? How do you get, uh, approach the Holy of Holies? What's the process before you go in? You've got to go through the gate. And you can try, you can try all kinds of other ways to get to the Holy of Holies. But if you don't go through the gate of Jesus Christ, you're not getting to the Holy of Holies. You're going somewhere else. I don't know what that building is that you're entering. But it's not the Holy of Holies. You're only going to get there by going through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the gate. He is the door. And you've got to accept the sacrifice. You must accept the sacrifice that Christ Jesus made for your life. You don't accept that sacrifice. You don't go any further. You must accept the sacrifice. Jesus' blood applied to your life. You must. There's no other way. Jesus says, I am that way. The truth and the life. No man comes to the Father. Except through me. <clears throat> and then you must be washed. You know, when you accept Jesus' sacrifice, we can dunk you as many times as you want. That's really not going to cleanse you. The cleansing happens at the altar. It's just whenever you get done with the altar, you look a lot better. When Christ cleans you up. That's really what's going on there. You're covered in Christ's blood. And then once you get that, once you wash all the blood off of you, you're clean. That's what makes you clean. Was it the water that really made you clean? Oh, it was the blood that cleansed you up. The water just wrecked. 
just helps us all recognize, hey, he's no longer dirty. She's no longer, she's no longer a sinner. She's now a saint. And then you get to the Holy of Holies. You must be covered with God's coverings. Your black heart's got to be covered with red blood and made white as snow, as sinless as the angels in heaven. That's the personality of the person goes in. Yeah, there are some very tough skinned people in this world. But they all must come to the Holy of Holies the same way. And they all look the same when they get there. None of us are different. There's none better. The ground is level at the cross. And it is there for all. The call goes to all. And God looks down on you. And he, does, and he says everyone is worth it. And he works in people's lives. Trying to get all to come. For whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord. Should be saved. But we know that all don't come. They're on the road. Many people like the broad way. But Jesus says, I'm the narrow way. And there's few that find it. There's only a few that say yes. There's only a few that are willing to come to that altar and say, yes, I want Jesus' blood applied to my life. There's only a few that say, I can handle that. There's other, most of them, they're like, no, I just cannot accept that. That doesn't make any sense to my mind. I realize it doesn't make any sense to you because God's ways are not your ways. His ways are so much higher than ours. And there's only one way that you're going to get into God's presence, and it's the way of the cross. You must come by way of the cross, the sacrifice that Jesus had, has, has paid for you. And when that has happened in your life, you may then enter into the Holy of Holies. Oh, and that's a good place to be. You know what's in the Holy of Holies? God's presence. You get to be in God's presence. We're not going to talk about it this week because I need another 45 minutes. Next week, we're going to talk about God's presence. But let me ask you something today. Are you allowed into the Holy of Holies? Have you gone through the way of the cross? Have you accepted blood, Jesus' blood on your altar? Have you been washed of all your sins? Or how those old country preachers say, the washed. You know, they got to throw that R in there. Or have, are you been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Are you covered with these coverings? Your black heart covered in red, the red blood of Jesus Christ. Washed white as snow. You know, I hope you can say yes to that. If you haven't, today's the day. Today's the day. Make sure that you are allowed into the Holy of Holies. Brother Sean and Isaac, would y'all come? Would y'all pray with me? Dear Lord, I just want to thank you for being so good. I want to thank you for this picture, for this pattern that you've presented to us Lord, so many people, they wonder how to be saved. And you painted, you painted a picture in the tabernacle that you gave to Moses. Lord, would you help us to receive this pattern? Would you help us to receive your son, Jesus Christ? Would you help us to accept the blood that was paid, that we would come through the gate of Jesus Christ to your altar and accept the sacrifice that was made? And Lord, that you would wash us white as snow so that we may enter into your presence and that you would cover us with your coverings lord not of not of the coverings that we cover ourselves because you know lord that this that these clothes that we put on they're just not good enough we need the clothing that comes from the god almighty lord and we just help ask that you would help our hearts to understand what you have really done for us Lord, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you as the Lord and Savior, Lord, may this be their day. If there's anybody here who, or who's not here, maybe they watch this later on. Lord, would you touch their hearts and help them to re be redeemed by your precious son's love. 
Guide us, Lord, in these thoughts. Help us to accept what you have done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You would stand with us and turn to number 479.